Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. Today we celebrate the 4th of July in the United States of America. This is the day, back in 1776, where our forefathers finalized a declaration for independence. We all must not take lightly the sacrifices made by the men and women back in 1776, nor any time in history. So first, I want to thank all the men and women protecting this great nation of ours, and in this upcoming episode, I'm going to cover part one of a two-part series of the life and career of the world's greatest athlete, Jim Thorpe. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is June 25th, 1876, which is basically a hundred years after the Declaration of Independence, and we are in Little Bighorn Valley. You see, this was the scene of the most decisive victory for the Native Americans in the Plains Indian War, which was a very long war, and most of you know it as the Battle of Little Bighorn, or you might also know it as the famous Custer's Last Stand. And why am I talking about Wars that happened, you know, all these years ago. What's the reason for it? Well, like I said, today is the day of our independence. And part of that was the independence for all peoples. And the guy we're going to talk about in this episode, Mr. Jim Thorpe, he was born 12 years after this battle. So you got to say, really, there was not that many years in between when America was still fighting with native people of this land. And Jim Thorpe was born on a reservation, which we're going to go ahead and take that DeLorean back up. We're going to go to May 28th, 1888, and we are in Prague, which is present-day Oklahoma. And it was Indian territory at the time. Jim Thorpe was born with the name James Francis Thorpe. But that wasn't really the name that he recognized as a young boy. He was predominantly American Indian. And this came from his mother's side, whom was a descendant of the last great Salk and Fox chief, Black Hawk. According to the ESPN Classic video that I saw, and I'm going to provide links to you, when a Native American mother would have a baby, she would name the baby after the first thing that she saw. And they mentioned how she saw the sun rising and there was a path. Kind of like through the trees or something like that. So what she named him was Wa Tholhuk, which translated into Bright Path. And Jim Thorpe would have, uh, let's just say his name Bright Path was an understatement. And Jim would go on to have one of those, you know, once in a millennia type of careers where just no other person could ever rival him. And he was Native American. And like I said, we had that, that war going on. And there wasn't a whole lot of getting along back in 1876, as there wasn't back in 1888 when he was born, which, like I said, he was born on a reservation. And this is going to be where we start the uh, journey of Jim Thorpe and what turned him from some American Indian on a reservation into what would become the world's greatest athlete. The first major adversity that Jim had to deal with was he had a twin brother, and at the age of eight, his twin brother passed away, and he was like one of his best friends. 
then six years later, his mother passed away. So Jim was this kind of, you know, kid that kind of lo- losing his way, doesn't quite understand what's going on in the world. They sp- they spoke in the video how he still had that I'm running with the, my feet and my heart to the ground, and I'm just my beat and my path and my warrior self inside of me. And then they were trying to put him into these schools, kind of forcing him to try to lose sight of his Native American heritage. So he was conflicted. And they said that when he would go into schools, he would just run away. And his partial Irish father just couldn't understand what was going on. He just didn't want to deal with it anymore. So what ended up happening was his father sent him away, finally, to a federally funded Carlisle Industrial Indian School in Pennsylvania in 1904. This is one of those schools where they were trying to, what they said, you know, bring out the Native American out of them and bring them more into, you know, the American type of way of life and that kind of thing. It wasn't just like a, you know, a middle school or a grade school. It was all the way up to college. And the ESPN Classic video that we talked about kind of described that this Carlisle Indian School was, it was basically a prison for these kids and, you know, they, they had horrible conditions. You might as well send them to prison. But out of this came what would end up being the legend that is Jim Thorpe. See, he was just gifted athletically. He was head and shoulders above the rest. There was not even a person that had a chance as far as athletic, just pure raw talent. And there was a specific event that kept coming up in all the different articles and videos and such about pretty much the time where Jim Thorpe was recognized as a guy who might have some potential. You know, this dude, just some random guy. But he happens to be just athletically gifted and possibly more talented than than anybody that this famous coach had ever seen before. It was kind of like this coach kind of was just randomly wandering around and he just fell upon the lost city of Atlantis. This mythical city that would just give you all this wealth and gold or whatever it is. And this legendary coach went by the name of Glenn Pop Warner. Yes, Pop Warner. Pop Warner football. That guy. Well, he was just, you know, just mouncing around, sitting there, and I guess there was some kids trying to do this high jump, and Jim Thorpe and street clothes started walking by. They said that he just kind of looked at them, saw what they were doing, studied their approach and seen what they did. Then all of a sudden, he just kind of, you know, hands his books over to this guy, say, hey, you know, take this, kind of like the whole, hey, hold my beer kind of thing. And he just waltzed on over there, proceeded to get to the approach, jump, lean back, and cleared the five foot eight inch mark. So then Pop Warner summoned Thorpe over and he said, come here, son. And of course, Jim probably thinking, hey, am I getting in trouble? Because maybe thinking I'm not supposed to be doing here. And and all Pop could do is just say, hey, son, you've only broken the school record on the high jump. That's all. So basically, Pop Warner says, you are, uh, yeah, you're hired for the team. You are now enlisted for the track and field. And in the first track and field match that he had, basically with no practice or even having any prior experience, Jim Thorpe went out and won seven of the gold and one bronze. Pretty much just won the entire meet for Carlisle without anybody else even competing. In an interview with Jim's son, he kept saying, you know, Pops would, you know, compete in eight different events and he'd win like six or seven or so and basically always win the entire thing by himself and they didn't even need to show up, you know? But this is a football podcast, and you don't want to listen to track and field all the time. You want to talk about some football. You see, like I said, Carlisle was his college as well. It was one of those things where just, you know, the whole time you're there. But Pop Warner didn't want him to play football because he knew that he had this star, the guy who could basically win every track meet by himself. But finally, he would give in. So I guess one day he said, uh, you know, here. Here's the Duke. Here's the football, man. You take that ball, try to run through those guys, and we'll see what you got. So then Jim Thorpe proceeds to pop that ball in his, I don't know if he was right-handed or left-handed. Probably figure that out. But he would pop that ball in his arm, and he would end up running over the entire team. So then Pop stops the practice. You know, he was beside himself. He said, how did that guy who had never played football 
run through my entire defense. He proceeded to take those guys on the sidelines, ripped them a new one, said, you know, all up and down the scene, said, you know what? This is a dude who had never played football in his entire life, and you're going to let him run through all of you? I am disappointed. Now you better step up, ship up, and you're going to stop this guy. So, Pop decides to give him the ball again. Jim Thorpe proceeds to just stomp over everybody in his way. Elbows, stiff arms, spins, stomp, splash, run, go. Gets through the entire defense all by himself. So then Pop said, well, I guess you're on the team then. And he would end up having an illustrious college career. But one of his best games came against Harvard. You know, Carlisle, a little school, Harvard, a dominant powerhouse, who actually ended up winning the championship in a specific year I'm about to talk about. But they had to go through Carlisle. And Carlisle was the only team that ended up beating him. And he ran for 173 yards, kicked four field goals, and the last one was a 48-yard field goal for the win. And he did all of this on a swollen ankle. Like I said, he was just by far and away the best athlete on the field at any given point in time. But he also had kind of like a bad reputation. You know, like a guy who was just some tough, just, you know, I grew up on a reservation and I had some problems and I don't feel like dealing with you, so I'm just going to take all my aggression and anger out on you. Better get out of the way. And here's a quote from his son from that ESPN Classic video. It went as such. These guys would come charging in on Dad, and Dad would just drop the ball and kick anybody that came close to him. So he put some of these guys in the hospital, and he had such a bad reputation for that that nobody wanted to charge in on him, end quote. His biggest college season ended up happening after he came back from the Olympics, where he would lead Carlisle to a 12-1-1 record, where he had 1,860 rushing yards on 191 attempts. For some reason, the Smithsonian article that I was reading said that two of these games that Thorpe played in, they didn't even include. So it's possible that he was the first ever 2,000-yard rusher in college, which also would have been just first 2,000-yard rusher period. But he also had 25 touchdowns, 198 points scored for the Carlisle Indians that year. So again, of course, he was an All-American. And all teams wanted Carlisle on their schedule because Jim Thorpe, he would bring the crowds. He would bring the money. He would make college football just continue to grow ever so more. But that is not what he was most famous for at this time. Like I said, he had this season after he came back from the Olympics. You're like, Olympics? What are you talking about here? This is a football podcast. Like I said, remember he was a track and field kind of like guru juggernaut? Well, that is, uh, let's say, the beginning of a good way to explain what he truly was when it came to Olympic track and field. For it was at the Olympics where Jim Thorpe would rise to become a world-renowned international sports superstar. But before we get into the event that made Jim Thorpe go from a standout football player at a small college to the world's greatest athlete, I want to remind you to head to thefootballhistorydude.com slash episode 12 for the show notes and to mash that little subscribe button on your favorite podcast player of choice to make sure you get the freshest, hottest off the press episodes each and every week. But now we're going to take the DeLorean over to May of 1912. And see, this is when the Olympic trials were being held in New York City. So basically, the story goes, Jim Thorpe went to these Olympic trials. He proceeded to win three of the five pentathlon events. And they told him, hey, you, know, you don't even have to do these trials anymore. You're in. And that ESPN Classic video, the guy said that, you know, it's possible he was one of the only guys, if not the only guy, in the history of American Olympics to not even have to go through the trials. Because he was just that much better than everybody. They're like, we don't want to waste your time, guy. So they sent him on his way. I mean, normally they were recruiting from colleges. Which, you know, because at the time it was a little bit different where it was pretty much just the wealthy families would be able to afford to take their kids and put them in college. So you're talking about these, you know, pressy pants and 
you know, always been giving everything to them kind of kids and, you know, the upper class of society and I'm holding my cup with my little finger in the air and that kind of thing. But Jim Thorpe was not one of these guys. He was just a tough, kind of came from a poor background, like I said, on a reservation, you know, running through the forest and I got my heart pumping with the ground and the earth and I'm just running through and I am wild and free. I'm not like one of these guys. So yeah, he was a little different. But part of the different was, you know what, he's just better than you. Physically talented and gifted, more dominant at any kind of sport you want to put him in. Physically, he is the alpha. Let's go with that. He was the alpha physical specimen. So they said, dude, don't even bother showing up. Just get on that boat and you're going to go over to Stockholm for the 1912 Olympics. And at the time, the Olympics were kind of more of a European thing. They weren't super popular in the States yet. But I think Jim's going to have a little bit to say about that. You see, even on the boat on the way over, there was an account where Mike Murphy found Jim in a hammock. And he was just sitting there. I guess he had his eyes closed. And Mike's like, uh, dude, what are you doing here? And he says, I'm just watching myself. I just cleared this vertical jump or this high jump or whatever it was. And he's just closing his eyes and envisioning it, which, you know, later on we call visualization and that kind of thing. But he was doing it back then when it wasn't a thing. He had the it factor. He knew what was going on. And when he arrived in Stockholm, he was five foot 11, 185 pounds. But he had like this neck like a linebacker. And they said when he would walk through the field, he would just, you know, puff his chest out. And he was just, looked like he was a monster, you know, like a, like a minotaur or something like that. Half horse, half man. I mean, they even called Jim the horse. You know, he was an exotic looking American Indian. So he caught the eye of the Swedish fans. So they all started to come watch him compete. You know, they got to see this horse. Like I'm calling the minotaur, half horse, half man. And he is just going to stampede on the competition. But he had never competed in a decathlon in his entire life. But he would start off with a pentathlon, which he would win the gold. Now, a little side note, his teammate on the U.S. Olympic team at the time also participated in the pentathlon. And that guy went by the name of George S. Patton. Yes, that's right. It was General George S. Patton one of the greatest military generals that this country ever produced. And he was on the boat. In fact, he was a teammate of Jim Thorpe, and they would compete together in the pentathlon. So after Jim wins the gold in the pentathlon, he's all like, there ain't no rest for the wicked, man. I'm getting right back on the horse, and I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to win that decathlon. Well, I mean, at the time we didn't know, but he had the confidence. You know what's coming on. The first event, he wins 100 meters. The second event, he wins the shot put. And he dominated. So basically by the fourth event out of 10, it was like pretty much over. And there was a quote from Frank Zarnowski, the author of the Decathlon. And it went as such. He dominated the first event in the Decathlon, which was the 100 meters. His shot put was better than anyone else's in the field. So by the time you get to the fourth event, it was pretty much over. He won by 700 points. And that's kind of like winning 15 to nothing in a baseball game or 45 nothing in a football game, end quote. Jim had 8,412 points out of a 10,000 total possible, which this is like basically unheard of at the time. The video said that they were still scoring this points, and you know, this was like still the normal, like in the 30s and 40s, which they finally, the athletes maybe caught up to Jim, but not quite. But the crazy thing is, two days after this, after the track part was done, he went and played in some baseball games. It was like, the dude just is a machine. He does not stop. So maybe what they called him earlier, you know, the horse, was true. Because horses can just basically run forever. So this horse, the Minotaur, he would end up coming home after the Olympics. Being praised beyond belief. He brought America to gold. He was going to become the world's greatest athlete. But the only issue was... He wasn't an American citizen yet because of being born in Indian territory. So even though he couldn't vote, he was bigger than the president of the United States at the time. And he was in magazines and penny novels and all sorts of stuff. And they would end up creating this unrealistic 
bigger than life image of Jim Thorpe. But later on in the next episode, we're going to find out that this is a good thing. At least for you and me as sitting here as NFL fans. Because they were going to use his fame and glory to try to put some traction into the NFL. We'll get into that next week. And to kind of wrap up this whole Olympics saga that Jim Thorpe had, I don't think I can even give it justice as far as just, you know, telling you what he did. I think the only thing we could have done is just watch how much more of a dominant person he was. I guess maybe Usain Bolt or or something like that, where he, you know, kind of like he was running and almost looked like he wanted to just turn around and start running backwards and waving to people. Uh, Maybe that's what it was like. But he did it in like 15 events, just that much better than everybody else. And the Swedish King Gustav would go to him and say this. Sir, you are the greatest athlete in the world, end quote. And the best part about it is, Jim said this, thanks, King. (laughs) So, it was like, the guy, he just, swagger, whatever, just, he was by far and away the most athletically gifted person of the time. So this brings us to the conclusion of part one of the life and career of Jim Thorpe. Like I said, The famous General George S. Patton finished fifth in the pentathlon at the 1912 Stockholm Olympics, four spots behind Thorpe. Patton was known for his aggressive attacking style and ability to read the battlefield, similarly to how Thorpe would observe a new sport and attack anything he did with ferocity. I would like to think that the time Patton spent with Jim Thorpe helped at least a little bit later on when Patton helped America win World War II. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about the life and career of Mr. Jim Thorpe. If you would like to give feedback to the show, please head over to thefootballhistorydude.com slash contact or hit me up on Twitter. My handle is at FHDude. In the upcoming episode, we're going to finish the discussion about the world's greatest athlete and learn how he helped shape the NFL. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.